This morning, let's take our Bibles and turn to the Old Testament book of Psalms. We're going to look at Psalms 1 through 10 under the title, God's Deliverance. The Psalms are songs. It's hard to believe it when you get into some of the long ones, such as 119. They're actually songs, kind of like our hymn book. But while our hymns are much more meaty and detailed than our worship choruses, um, I consider our hymns to appeal more to the mind and the worship choruses uh, to the heart, if you don't fall asleep with the same repetition of the three or four words. Uh, when you get into Psalms, uh, these are incredible uh, statements of theology, of doctrine, uh, but they're meant to be sung. They were sung, and they were the hymn book of the temple, and David is a contributor to some of those Psalms. We're going to see those today. Uh, they were also the devotional guide for the Jewish people, and uh, there are 150 songs altogether. Uh, they cover many topics. They build faith, they uh, teach worship within the heart. And I think the lesson for all of Psalms is uh, from Psalm 13. I will sing to the Lord, he has dealt bountifully with me. Uh, so I love the Psalms. I don't know where you go when you are feeling down or dark or having need. Perhaps you go to Leviticus. <laughs> I find if you are depressed and you go to Leviticus, you'll become even more depressed <laughs> and realize your problems aren't so bad. But, um, but I seriously go to uh, Psalms when I want to uh, be encouraged or uplifted. Um, when I was a lawyer, I uh, started a little Bible study and uh, it was amazing, the attendance of our staff. When the uh, managing partner has a Bible study, it's amazing the attendance that he gets. And uh, so they all came in, and we had a wonderful time going through Proverbs. Proverbs was a great study for a business and for life. And uh, Proverbs, again, appeals to my head, but Psalms appeals to my heart. Um, one of the most wonderful things about seminary, if there was anything wonderful about it, was that my final doctrinal uh, dissertation was to go through Psalms and make my own devotions and then give sermons on those. Can you imagine a job like that, to go through the Psalms and apply it to your life? It was the most wonderful study that I ever, ever had. So with that in mind, let's go to the Lord for help. Father, we're grateful for this chance to study your word. Help us to really have our hearts and our minds and our spirits stirred toward you. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 1, well-known psalm, the way of the righteous and the way of the ungodly or the end of the ungodly. We're going to see in the first three verses that the godly are blessed. And then by contrast, in verses 4 to 6, the ungodly are cursed. So God is teaching in this psalm the way every parent does, the way every teacher does in school, the way they do in government or employment. Do well, you'll be blessed. Don't do well, you'll be cursed. Blessed. The word blessed is a $5 word which means simply happy. Happy or blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly or the wicked nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates, ponders, or talks to himself about the word day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. So happy is the man who is walking with God, walking with God by staying close to God in his word. That's how you stay close to God. Blessed is the man, in verse 1, who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Notice the first thing we do if we are walking rightly is we're walking with the godly, not the ungodly. He doesn't stand in the path of the sinners and if you're going to get into trouble, the very first thing you do is to walk with ungodly people. There's somebody in your family, perhaps, who always gravitates toward the bad kids. There's somebody in the family who always gravitates towards the good kids. And you can watch it. There are certain kids that they, they can transfer from school district to school district, and within a matter of days, they know where the bad kids are, 
or the good kids, and they gravitate in that direction. It's amazing. It's almost in their DNA, uh, the old nature DNA, I suppose. But the very first thing you do when you're going to be in trouble is to walk with the ungodly. The godly person doesn't do that. Once you walk with the ungodly, then you begin to stand with the sinners, hang around a little bit with them. And that's not good. Then finally, we find this individual sitting in the seat of the scornful. So first you walk with those that are not good, then you sit to your stand, then you finally sit with them. Wasn't that Peter's problem? When the Lord was arrested and he was taken before the priest, the high priest, and uh, what did our friend Peter do? John was very close to Jesus, got right in there with him and did not have any trouble. But Peter stood afar off and then he moved a little closer and then got to the enemy's fire and then he sat with the enemy and denied the Lord three times. So that's the pattern when you and I sin. We walk with the ungodly, then we stand and become more comfortable with them, shoot the breeze. Finally, we're sitting with them. We're one of them. But the ungodly person does that. Here, the godly person doesn't do that. He makes sure he does not walk with the ungodly, doesn't stand uh, with the sinners. He doesn't sit with the scornful. But focus, verse 2, he focuses on the law, gets into God's word. His delight is in the law of God the Lord. He loves God's Word. And then in his law, he meditates day and night. He talks to himself. He ponders. Now, it's good to read. It might be better to read and to uh, talk to yourself about it, because when you're reading, you're engaging your mind, your eyes, but when you're talking, you're using your mouth, using your ears, and it's getting in there more and more. I'm still thrown after over a year of marriage. I get up with my wife. We're the first ones up in this large household. And um, I'm doing my cat litter duty and walking dogs. And then I, I hear her talking. And I'm wondering, well, she's not talking to me. And there's nobody else who's awake. And who's she talking to? And she's in the Word of God. She starts with Psalm 91 and then goes from there. She's talking to herself. She's talking to God. She's meditating on God's Word. So she gets the Word in her. And I get the litter boxes cleaned, so that's good. <laughs> um, incidentally, each one does what he can do. I can't read anymore. I mean, I have the eyes. And I haven't got the patience to read anymore. You know what I do? You know how I study for these messages? You know how I study the Word? I'm in the car a lot, and I've got the Bible on tape. I have my teachings from years ago. I have the, uh, the, the reading of the Bible, New King James, with all the orchestration and what have you. I listen to the Word constantly. Find a way that works for you. Uh, I can't sit and pray. I'll sit and sleep. So I walk with my dogs and pray. That's my way of, of doing it. But find a way that works for you. Pray and read the Word of God. Otherwise, if you don't stay in God's law, look at verse 1 again. You're going to start walking with the ungodly. You're going to stand with the sinners. You're going to sit with the scornful. But if you will be in God's law and you avoid those who are wrong, verse 3, you'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither. So we are to bear fruit. Jesus tells us in John 15 that if we don't bear fruit, he's the vine, we're the branches. What do you do with the branch that does not bear fruit? You break it off, you toss it into the fire. And so he says you need to bear fruit. And what do you have to do? What's a branch have to do to bear fruit in the vine? Hang in there. That's all you have to do. Just hang into the source. Stay close to the Lord again in his word. And whatever you do is going to prosper. That's God's promise. Now, concentrating on the ungodly, they're going to be cursed. Look at verse 4. The ungodly are not so. They're not going to bear fruit. But they're like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So by contrast, in verse 4, instead of fruit which is substantial, the chaff is light and just flies away. There's a lot of imagery uh, and reference in the Bible to... Uh, wheat and chaff, beating it out. And even in some of the more primitive cultures today, they still do the same thing. You get up on a high hill, you find a flat slab of stone, you get some wheat, 
and you begin to bang it against the stone, or maybe if you've got uh, a stick, you can beat that, or if you've really got some money, you get a, an animal to walk over it, or you walk over it. Next thing you know, the shell is being cracked, then you get a shovel, and you take that shovel, and you get the substance, and you throw it up in the air. There's a little bit of breeze there. What happens? The heavy wheat falls to the stone floor, the chaff flutters away and is no more. That's how they separate the wheat from the chaff. That's how God's going to do it in the end time. Those who are his, he'll gather into his storehouse, the fruit, the, uh, those who are heavy and strong and productive for the Lord. But the chaff, it just drives away, verse 4. Uh, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment. They're never going to have a chance when the Lord judges them. Nor the sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Uh, they don't want to do that. When I sin, the last thing I want to do is be in the congregation of the righteous. When I sin, the last thing I want to do is lift up holy hands and bless the Lord. And you're the same way. We have to ask God's forgiveness and come back in and realize the righteousness we have and need is from Jesus Christ. So that's the Psalm 1, the ungodly and the godly. What a contrast, huh? Well, it all depends upon the Messiah, whether you're godly or you're not godly whether you've received the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And Psalm 2 is a psalm about the Messiah, his triumph, and his glorious kingdom. We find, first of all, the condition of man in verses 1 through 3. Man rebels. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. That's the condition of man. Romans chapter 1 talks about the fact that man is not looking for God, but trying to cast off God. We find all sorts of ways to do that. In our own lives, we're not always coming to him to be our director, our guide, our savior. We listen to the science programs on the television, the radio, the internet. That's all about man developing himself in some way instead of God being the creator. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You don't hear that much on the Discovery Channel or other science, so-called not intelligent uh, sources of input here. So man is casting off God. It's the natural tendency of the sinful man to rage against the Lord to set themselves against God. And it's not just the kings and the leaders, but every time I sin, I'm doing the same thing. I know I'm supposed to do the right thing, and I go out and do the wrong thing. I'm setting myself off against the king, the Messiah, against the Lord, and I'm doing it against his anointed. Don't, don't miss verse 2. The anointed of the Lord, the one who's commissioned. The Hebrew word is Messiah or Mashiach, the Christ. So every time we sin, we are setting ourselves against the Messiah. We're saying, let's break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. I'm tired of the restrictions of the Lord. I want to go out and do my thing my way when I want to. And that's that struggle that we have between the old nature and the new nature. Paul talks about that in Romans 7. The good that I want to do, I don't do. The evil I don't want to do, I do. And there's this horrible struggle within me. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I feel like I'm dead. Then he goes on to say in Romans chapter 8, thank God, through Jesus Christ. So there's this tendency to rebel against God. But here's God's response in verses 4 through 6. Is God nervous because we're casting him off? Is God nervous because the nations are not following him? He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. There's going to be a judgment day. There's going to be an accounting day. God gets the last word. God gets the last laugh. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. He has set the king, the Lord Jesus, on the holy hill of Zion. He wants to set the king Jesus on our hearts as well. Lord Jesus, sit on the throne of my heart. Old nature, wicked self, get out, descend, and let the Lord ascend. Should be the prayer of our hearts every day. Verse 7, 
Messiah is going to reign. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me. You are my son. There's a reference to the deity of the Lord Jesus. God is the Father speaking to the Son. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. So God has given the nations to the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't look as though right now he's possessing them, but he's still king. He's king in heaven and he's king in the hearts of those here on earth who receive him. One day he's going to return as king of kings in the millennium and then he will reign with a rod of iron. Verse 10, Now therefore be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. So here's the lesson we ought to be giving to the world. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Can you imagine if the Secretary General gave us a phone call and said, come on down to the United Nations. We have all the nations here present and the translator is there and I want you to just give us three verses from the Bible to address to all the leaders of the world. What would you choose? I think these would be three good verses. Men and women and leaders of all the nations of the world at the United Nations, hear this. Be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son. That means to embrace him lest he discipline you, be angry with you, and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are those who put their trust in him. So can you imagine that happening? (laughs) Only in your dreams, huh? But those would be some good verses to share. Those are verses to share with anybody. In other words, for the time that you have, and you're not sure how long that's going to be, kiss the sun. Well, you can picture this if we were to... Uh, Look at uh, Queen Elizabeth's uh, reign and uh, you see those who would go, or the the, the Pope when he's uh, uh, in the room, what do do the people do? They go and they would kiss the ring, wouldn't they? It's a sign of submission, of yielding. I acknowledge your leadership. We should do the same thing. Bow the knee before the Lord Jesus. Psalm 3 talks about the Lord's help in trouble. And this is the first psalm that we have, which is going to be uh, clearly written by David. And you're going to be able to tell David's psalms from the others for the most part. You know how you tell them? Watch the first person. David talks to God like a personal friend. Psalm 1 and 2 are more distant, talking about God in the third person. He is great. He is awesome. Watch David's psalms. Born out of adversity, being chased by King Saul, being chased by his son Absalom, being chased by the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, and all the ites. All sorts of trouble. And because of that, it drove him to his knees and a personal relationship with God. And as a result, we find an intimacy and a personal closeness that you don't find with the other psalmists. And so I have to be honest with you that when I am in trouble, I go to Psalms. When I'm really in trouble, I go to Psalms written by David. And parenthetically, I love David's Psalms. I don't like the guy when I see him in 2 Samuel and 1 Samuel. I don't like the guy when I see him in Kings. I think he's pretty hostile, pretty tough. But I love his Psalms, and he's taught me, you don't judge people. You don't judge their walk with God. You look at their relationship with the Lord and let the Lord sort it all out. I love David's personality when it comes to God. He's a bit bipolar. If he were alive today, he might check in now and then to the psych center at Albany Med or Ellis uh, to get things checked out. He's up, he's down. Uh, When I was young, we didn't call that bipolar. We called that something which I was accused of, an artistic temperament. And so uh, we all had that artistic temperament in the old days. Now they say, hey, bipolar, give him some pills, next case, and that's it. Psalm 3, look at David. The Lord helps his people who are troubled. His own son Absalom was chasing him out of town, trying to kill his own father. And so 
He's going to tell us here in Psalm 3, despite our enemies, God sustains us and God saves us. Look at verse 1 of Psalm 3. Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. We all have enemies, don't we? We have people who don't like us. People who are trying to bury us one way or the other. People who have told us, get out of my life. I don't want to see you anymore. I'll make sure you never get ahead, never get promoted. We struggle in ourselves to like certain people. We can be with people in a matter of two minutes or three minutes, and we like some people and don't like others. And that's such a natural tendency. Well, he says, I've got enemies, and they're increasing. But he says in verse 3, God's going to sustain me. But you, O Lord, I love that word, but. I've got enemies, but you, O Lord, are a shield for me. You're my protection, my glory, and the one who lifts up my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. Notice I. David's always talking first person. I was in trouble. I had a need. God was there. He met that need. As a result, verse 5, I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Now, probably you and I don't have 10,000 people against us. David did at times. Some of those nations easily outnumbered 10,000 against him, against the people of Israel, against the Lord. But he trusted in God, and he was always successful. Under David, the kingdom of Israel stretched further than it ever had before. Solomon, his son, was able to maintain it through intermarriage with the leaders of different uh, uh, nations, families, but it was David who really stretched those borders far beyond what the borders are today in Israel. And only when the Lord Jesus, the greater David, the son of David comes, will those borders be fully what God has. And incidentally, they won't be squabbling over the Gaza Strip or about the West Bank or the city of Jerusalem. Israel then is going to spread down to the Wadi in Egypt, all the way up to the Euphrates River where modern day Iraq and uh, and that area is as well. All that's going to be Israel's, but only when Jesus returns to establish it. So, save me, O God. Or let's look at verse 5. I lay down and slept. I awoke for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. He was able to sleep. You know where he was sleeping half the time? Out in the cold in some cave, behind some tree. What was his blanket? His outer garment, what he was wearing? That's about it. He didn't have a house in those early days. And David was best with God when he was on the lamb and when he was being chased and when he was being hunted. Didn't do so well when he was ensconced in luxury and had others go out and do the fighting for him. Kind of a lesson in our lives as well. Marriages usually do well, hard as they are, in the beginning stages when money is tight and they really have to work together. Might not do so well when the kids are gone and the IRA is coming in and there's lots of money and there's not that challenge to work together against adversity. We don't always do well in times of luxury, spiritually speaking. Verse 7, arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. For you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Ah, here it is. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. David knows who his Savior is. He is the Lord. Psalm 4 is another psalm of David. Again, very personal. Talking about the safety of the faithful. He says, God hears me. Because God hears me, I will trust him. Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have relieved me in my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. See how personal this is? These will not be the psalms of the professional psalm writers like Asaph, not even of Moses. Nobody among these psalmists knew the Lord the way David did. Nobody had the adversity 
and the need to call upon the Lord the way David did. Now remember also, David is well trained to be a songwriter. What was David's first job before he became a soldier, before he slayed Goliath? What was his first job? He was out there in the wilderness with a few little sheep and to occupy himself time-wise, he would play an instrument and sing, pass the time. And then when King Saul had a distressing spirit and they needed someone to come in and be a minstrel to drive the demonic spirit away, David was hired. David came and that's how he began. And he loved Saul and he ministered to Saul and that spirit left. Evidence that one of the best ways to get rid of a demonic spirit is to pour on the praise. When I would get into a negative spirit, my mother would just crank out, praise the name of, drove me crazy, Jesus. And she'd be off key and I'd have to help her out. Then I'd begin to sing, praise the name of Jesus. Oh, sunny, the sun is out there after all. And that darkness just lifted, just lifted. Put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. All right. That was not original. Isaiah got that <laughs> long before I did. All right. How verse 2, how long, O you sons of men, will you turn my glory to shame? How long will you love worthlessness and seek falsehood? That's the world, isn't it? Loving worthlessness. People in our own families are just loving worthlessness. Maybe we are as well. How are we passing the time with worthless, seeking falsehood? But know that the Lord has set apart for himself him who is godly. The Lord will hear when I call to him. God has set you apart and he's waiting to hear. You ever see a situation in daycare? All the kids, the mothers come in. Unless the kid is showing a temper tantrum, which can happen a time or two, usually when the mother's voice is uttered, that child responds. Also with dogs. I've been in dog parks with a number of dogs running around. When the masters call them, they know who belongs to them and they go with their master. God has set us apart. He knows our voice. He's our shepherd and we know his voice as well. Be verse, verse 4, he says, Be angry and do not sin. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. I think David there may be lying down one night when his enemies are chasing him and he's afraid and he's angry and he's resentful. And he has to talk to himself now and say, simmer down. Verse 4, be angry and don't sin. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. Or translated, shut your mouth. How can you be angry and not sin? Was Jesus ever angry? Did he not make a cord of whips and just drive out the money changers? Was he not angry at that time? How can you be angry and not sin? When your anger is righteous indignation. That's hard. That means I'm angry because this is wrong, what's being done. It's going against God's principles. I'm angry about abortion. I'm angry about robbery. I'm angry about this and such. But the problem is when it gets personal and we start to then grind because we're angry that it's not going our way, then it's, it's sin. Then you need to ask forgiveness. And uh, it can start off being righteous, but be careful because it can get very personal we are selfish human beings and we start making this apply to our lives and I'm not being treated well and I'm angry for myself, then it's wrong. But for this righteous indignation, you can be angry, but don't sin. Don't cross that line of getting into selfishness. Meditate within your heart. Again, talk to yourself on your bed and be still. We need to talk less to God and listen more. Sometimes we talk and 
we get into explaining things to God like he's somewhere else, he's out in Utica and doesn't know what's going on. Uh, Lord, here's the situation. Let me, let me brief you on this. I know you're smart. You'll pick this up in a hurry. Uh, duh, he had this situation in mind thousands of years ago. Listen. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. I offer the Lord Jesus Christ and my relationship with him. That's where my righteousness is. Now there are many who say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. You have put gladness in my heart more than in the season that their grain and wine increased. Gladness should be in our hearts with the Lord. When you are with the Lord, gladness should be your portion, more so than with wine and with grain. I think about Solomon writing Ecclesiastes. Solomon wrote Proverbs in the early part of his life. A lot of the wisdom came from this wonderful father, David. And later in life, he got discouraged. A thousand women in his life and all the wealth and all the wisdom. And he came down to the conclusion in Ecclesiastes, the only thing that's worthwhile in life is a good meal and your wine and your work. Good job and a good meal. Everything else is worthless. So all the women in his life, all the kids, all the possessions, all of that. And really at the end, even his relationship with the Lord didn't mean anything. Because all those women came in with their demon gods and goddesses and he worshipped with them. And he lost a real sense of that closeness with God the way his father David had. And so he didn't really find the gladness of the Lord the way David had. Toward the end of his life, he didn't have it. How sad. He couldn't say in verse 7, you've put gladness in my heart the way David could say. All he could say is, the grain and the wine have increased and I like that. So let's be more like David and less like Solomon. I will both lie down in peace and sleep for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. So I get a lot of people say, I wish I could sleep, I have insomnia. Uh, get into the Psalms and let there be a peace about it. And you'll find that as you get into these psalms, your peace will settle. If that doesn't work, the surefire thing is go to YouTube under Pastor Jerry Lynn, get one of these sermons on video, you'll fall asleep, say, no, no, and out you'll go like a light, okay? Psalm 5, a prayer for guidance. I trust you, Lord. Guide me and deliver me is the theme here. And again, it's David. Now, David is a songwriter. He does the music, he does the lyrics. Oh, uh, he also not only plays the instruments, he invents instruments. How about that? Huh? He's the ultimate musician. And uh, he gives instructions. This one is to be done with flutes. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Give heed to the voice of my cry, my King and my God. For to you I will pray. My voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct it to you, and I will look up. As I mentioned, my wife goes to the chair as soon as she gets up, gets the coffee started, sits right in her prayer chair, and just lifts her voice up. Starts talking to the Lord. She looks up to Him. I'm lucky to get a quick kiss on the way out. That's about it. She's focusing in on the Lord. That's what we should be doing. Whether you're sitting in the chair with your coffee, or you're doing the litter box, or whatever, Look to the Lord. Put him first. Verse 4, For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness, nor shall evil dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand in your sight and hate all workers of, you hate all workers of iniquity. You shall destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. We think sometimes it pays to dance with the devil. No. That the wicked have a better deal on earth than we do here. No. Look at the end and where they're going to be in the end. And they don't have God right now to protect them and to help them. But as for me, I will come into your house in the multitude of your mercy. In fear of you, I will worship toward your holy temple. We should have a fear of God. That's a holy reverence. We don't walk in with a cavalier attitude towards God. Hey, bro, good to see you. Let's hang together. Uh, no, God isn't quite your bro. Um, He's your Lord, your Savior. 
There was that tendency back in the late 70s and 80s, the songwriters were getting all excited about Jesus, our friend and brother, and they were getting into that. I was a little bit nervous about it. Yeah, he is our brother in the Lord, but he's also our God. He's our Savior, and he did, he's the one that we should kiss, kiss the ring, uh, lest we not be saved. And so uh, there's this attitude of the fear of the Lord. Verse 8, lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before my face. Lord, I need to know exactly how to go here. I've got problems. And, you know, sometimes on your job you've got problems. You've got little clicks. You've got even maybe danger on your job. How do I go? What do I do? Um, and uh, you've got to really, really be careful. Again, talking about Kelly, my favorite subject. Uh, she just changed to her new job as a, as a psych nurse from being a rehab nurse, a little bit different. Rehab people, you approach them one way. Psych people, on drugs, getting off drugs, coming on drugs, some with uh, murderous tendencies, histories, and what have you, you're very careful. No, na no last names, no touching, no nothing. You have to learn how to handle yourself now it's an enclosed area with glass and protection and guards and stuff. Lord, give me wisdom as to who I talk with. She doesn't just walk up to a patient, hi, how are you here? She has to read in the Lord what's going on. It can be dangerous. And so with all of us, whether it's physical danger or what have you, Lord, whatever. She got a little bit of a discouragement when she saw one of her patients recently arrested, stabbed somebody, almost died. So you've got to really be careful. Lord, give me wisdom today as to how to handle this day and how to handle every situation that I encounter. God will give it to you. He goes on to say, verse 9, there's no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is destruction. Their throat is an open tomb. They flatter with their tongue, talking about the unrighteous. Lord, I need you to deliver me. He says in verse 12, for you, O Lord, will bless the righteous, will favor you, with favor, you'll surround him with a shield. David understood a shield being a soldier, a protection against the enemy. Lord, be my shield. Be my protection against the fiery darts of the enemy. You know, that's a very real thing that Paul talks about. Uh, the enemy can't destroy us, can't touch us, can't do anything to us unless God allows it. But the one thing he can do is he can send those fiery darts into our minds, doubts of fear, doubts of unbelief, depression, and we have a shield. If we will go to the Lord in prayer, we put that shield up and defend ourselves. Psalm 6 talks about faith in distress. God will deliver me, and I know, God, that you have heard me. Again, this is a psalm of David, and this time he wanted it played with stringed instruments. In fact, he wanted an eight-stringed harp. So he is the ultimate musician and conductor O oh Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure. Have mercy on me, O oh Lord, for I am weak. O oh Lord, heal me, for my bones are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled. But you, O oh Lord, how long? How long will I have to go through this? Can you see why people go to the Psalms when they're having trouble? Return, O oh Lord, deliver me. O oh, save me for your mercy's sake. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In the grave, who will give you thanks? I am weary with my groanings. All night I make my bed swim. I drench my couch with my tears. My eye wastes away because of grief. It grows old because of all my enemies. So he did his fair share of crying. Yes, he's being poetic here, but I'm sure he's had his few tearful nights. And if, if you're one of the eight wives and several concubines uh, married to him, you'd say, well, no one's going to see David tonight. He's in one of those moods. And he would be crying before God. But out of that crying came forth a beautiful psalm to encourage him and to encourage countless people through the ages who have also had their sleepless, tearful nights. Verse 8, Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity, for the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Let all my enemies be ashamed and greatly troubled. Let them turn back and be ashamed suddenly. Paul encourages us that we groan. Romans 8 talks about animals groaning because of the sin condition of life. and We groan because of sin and problems. But he also mentions somebody else who groans. 
the Holy Spirit. When you and I can't even groan, things are so bad, we just don't even know what to say. There is one who is groaning, and that's the Holy Spirit. He's groaning on our behalf, and the one he's groaning to, Paul says, is the Father. And the Father reads those groans, interprets our grief, and ministers for us. Do keep in prayer those who are groaning, those who are hurting. One of our ladies is doing very well, but this week she had to bury her husband. Six weeks after she buried her brother. Six weeks after she buried her sister. So keep Mary in prayer. Keep others around you in prayer. It wouldn't do any harm sometime to just throw out a question like, how are you doing? And not just walk away, but wait for an answer and look for an opportunity to minister. There are those who are hurting, who need a care. Not just a, sorry for your loss. Have a great day. Leave it on the altar, but what can I do to help? I can start off by giving you a little bit of time. I can postpone the dishes. I can postpone going to the grocery store. Let's talk. What's on your heart? And then minister Jesus always. Chapter 7. Prayer and praise for deliverance from the enemies. And again, our friend David here. This is a meditation. And it's a, a song to the Lord. It's about a man named Cush, who is a Benjamite. Again, God's going to deliver me because God is just. O Lord, my God, in you I put my trust. Save me from all those who persecute me and deliver me, lest they tear me like a lion, rending me in pieces while there is none to deliver. O Lord, my God, if I have done this, if there's iniquity in my hands, if I've repaid evil to him who was at peace with me, or have plundered my enemy without cause, let the enemy pursue me and overtake me. Yes, let him trample my life to the earth and lay my honor in the dust. If I've done wrong, all right, I'll pay the price. But if I haven't, Lord, help me. Word selah, people want to know what the word selah means. It's a musical term. It means pause. Remember, this is a song. It's being sung. And so as they sing that last in Hebrew about laying my honor, in the, you pause for a moment. That's all selah means. Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up because of the rage of my enemies. Rise up for me to the judgment you have commanded. So the congregation of the people shall surround you. For their sakes, therefore, return on high. The Lord shall judge the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to my integrity within me. I've served you, Lord. Defend me, is what he's saying. Oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end but establish the just, for the righteous God tests the hearts and minds. My defense is of God, who saves the upright in heart. Verse 11 says, God is a just judge, and God is angry with the wicked every day. If he does not turn back, he will sharpen his sword, he bends his bow. So God's going to take care of the wicked. And his response, verse 17 I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness and will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. It all comes down to praise. I will sing and I will praise. All because he was starting off as a young little lad with those sheep learning to sing to God, learning to praise. You know, my mother used to say, God never wastes a thread in the fabric of your life. Every fabric, every thread has a purpose. Maybe a bad fabric or a bad thread, but it all was for a purpose. God is using every little bit of it for where you are today. The good and the bad, the up and the down, the victory and the defeat, all part of God's plan. Psalm 8. Again, David talks about the glory of the Lord in creation, and he gives instructions to the chief musician there in the temple. It's to be used on a particular instrument, the instrument that was obtained from the city of Gath, of the Philistines. O Lord, he says here in Psalm 8, you're glorious in strength. O Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, can you just see this little shepherd boy out there at night? having to be all by himself, far away from 
family, sound of wolves in the background. He's got his little sheep there who can't really defend him. He's looking at the moon and the stars and hearing the howling of some animal. But he's thinking about God. I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars. What is man that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? For you've made him a little lower than the angels and you've crowned him with glory and honor. You've made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet. Sheep, oxen, the beasts of the field, birds of the air, fish that pass through the paths of the seas. You know how long it was, the story goes, that nobody who was sailing back in Christopher Columbus's time knew this. It wasn't until a sea captain in the 19th century was laid up and sick in a London hospital that he was reading his Bible and he talked, he came across this thing about the paths of the sea. He said, paths of the sea? There are paths in the sea? He got out, he got well, he began to put bottles in the water and he began to look and see that they were congregating into paths. And he thought, gee, if the ships could sail along the paths, they could go easier without as much fuel. And today, no respectable sea person would travel without knowing where the sea paths, the sea lanes are. And so uh, the Bible teaches us things we did not know on our, on our own. So verse 9, O Lord, how, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Uh, psalm 9 is again a psalm of David, and this time he is telling the chief musician, I want this song sung to a particular tune, Death of the Sun. Now David sometimes would have several songs to the same tune, even as some of our hymn writers did the same thing. You might have a certain hymn, this, uh, the, the melody, but it could be several hymns that have those words put to it. Here in Psalm 9, talking about God's righteous judgment, God, you're righteous. Therefore, save me from my enemies. I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell of all your marvelous works. I'll be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Notice how declarative that is, how strong that is. Next time we're feeling weak and depressed and abused and pushed around and poor me, let's start to make these kinds of statements. I'm going to praise the Lord. Get your eyes on Jesus, get your eyes off yourself. What a wonderful remedy that is. When my enemies turn back, they shall fall and perish at your presence. You've maintained my right and my cause. You sat on the throne judging in righteousness. You've rebuked the nations, you've destroyed the wicked. You've blotted out their name forever. O enemy, destructions are finished forever. You've destroyed cities. Even their memory has perished, but the Lord shall endure forever. So we can look at the world scene today and see the atrocities going on of all sorts. We look at ISIS going on over in the so-called Islamic State. We look at Boko Haram in Nigeria. We look at the, the Taliban. And, 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 and where is God in all this? And this is going to last forever and ever. Well, according to the paper today, they're prevailing. But according to the Word of God, they will not prevail. God will prevail. There is a judgment. And even here on earth, good will rise up to come against evil. Meanwhile, we pray and ask God to protect and to uh, minister on behalf of those who are being so uh, badly used, and many times because of their Christian faith. Verse 9, the Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble, and those who know your name will put their trust in you. That's true, when you know his name, you'll put your trust in the Lord. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who see, seek you. He tells us now, sing praises to the Lord. Those who, who, who he dwells in Zion, declare his deeds among the people. In other words, share the good news about Jesus. When he avenges blood, he remembers them. He does not forget the cry of the humble. And then he turns it personally. Have mercy on me, O Lord. Consider my trouble from those who hate me, who, have, who lift me up from the gates of death, that I may tell of your praise in the gates of the daughters of Zion. I'll rejoice in your salvation. The nations have sunk down in their pit, which they made, in the net which they hid. The wicked shall be turned into hell, verse 17, and all the nations that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord, don't let man prevail. Let the nations be judged in your sight. Put them in fear, O Lord that the nations may know themselves to be but men. And finally, Psalm 10. 
This one does not uh, say that it's David. Can you tell that it's not David? You're going to see that there's not much about the personal relationship here. It's more of a declaration of who God is. Nothing wrong with the Psalms that are not David's. They're just different, that's all. Here in Psalm 10, we find God triumphing over evil. Yes, the wicked are strong, but God's going to defeat them. Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? The wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. For the wicked boasts of his heart's desire. He blesses the greedy, renounces the Lord. The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. Isn't that true? His ways are always prospering. Doesn't that seem like the way the wicked seem to prosper here? Your judgments are far above, out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he sneers at them. He says in his heart, I shall not be moved. I shall never be in adversity. That's that proud, arrogant attitude of the unbeliever. Verse 8, he sits in the lurking places of the villages. He uh, fixes his eyes on the helpless, verse 8, lies in wait as a lion in the den. Verse 10, he crouches, he lies low. This is a period, this is a picture of wickedness and what's going on. But then the psalmist cries out in verse 12, Arise, O God, arise, O Lord, lift up your hand. Do not forget the humble. Why do the wicked renounce God? He has said in his heart, you will not require an account. But you have seen, for you observe trouble and grief to repay it by your hand. The helpless commits himself to you. You're the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness until you find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations have perished out of his land. Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You'll prepare their heart. You'll cause your eye to hear, to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may oppress no more. Great psalm, not a psalm of David. Nothing personal there. It's just about how great God is. And all the psalms are wonderful. They all declare the truths. But David is the one who really gets into that personal relationship with God, which makes him so wonderful. And uh, I don't think we need to live just in the Psalms of David, but we ought to be living in that personal relationship with him. Kind of like somebody who knows about the governor versus somebody who really knows the governor personally. Um, David really knows the Lord personally. It makes all the difference. Um, why did he know him personally? Because he had such adversity? Because he cried out to the Lord? The Lord met his needs? Put him into more adversity? He cried out even more? Even more met his needs? He increased and grew from faith to faith. So I want to grow close to the Lord, but I don't want any trouble in my life. <laughs> it's not going to work that way. Now, if you want to know uh, the Lord, you're going to have to be uh, entering into his sufferings, Paul said. Um, important thing is, God delivers. God cares for us. He loves us. Uh, many are sneering at the, uh, the Lord. Many are throwing off his bonds. But he has a Messiah. And he has set the Messiah in heaven. Psalm 2 tells us that. And uh, the Messiah reigns. And he'll reign in your heart today. And he'll meet your needs and he'll be your shield. He'll be your sword. So with that in mind, I'd like to uh, just have you go inward for a moment and see if there's an area in your life that needs healing. Maybe you need physical healing today. Or maybe you need some emotional healing. Maybe it's healing of finances. Uh, healing in your spiritual walk. Uh, someone the other day said, I just don't feel like rereading God's word. I said, I had that happen several times, and here I was a pastor. That was my, my life's mission, was to be in the Word of God. I had to say, Lord, I'm getting dry. I'm getting dry. Rekindle that love, and he did it. He did it. So whatever your need is, let's go to the Lord right now and make him our shield and our provider. Father, we're grateful for these 10 Psalms, and we're really excited about the journey we're going to have in the many uh, weeks ahead through Psalms. We're going to ask you, Lord, to help us not only to approach it with our heads, to analyze what's being said, but perhaps even more importantly, with our hearts, to enter into that full sense of intimate, personal relationship with you the way David had. We have troubles. We will have troubles. But you are always there to meet our needs. 
Lord Jesus, please come into our hearts. We believe you were raised from the dead for our righteousness, our justification. We believe, Lord, that you are going to come again and establish your kingdom and get this world back in proper order. But Lord, right now, come into our hearts, ascend the throne of our hearts, and we descend the throne right now. I just take the scepter of rule in my life and I hand it to you and say, you run my life. You make the decisions. You be Lord. And Lord, help us to kiss the sun every day and receive the fruitful benefits, the bountiful benefits of the branch connected to the vine. You are the vine, we're the branches. Bring forth your fruit in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.